Welcome back to Before the Day Ends. We're continuing our series in the Gospel of Matthew, and we are specifically looking at chapters 5 through 7, which is the second half of the first book of Matthew, if you will. And this is Jesus' renewed covenant with us. It is a covenant, a contract. And in the first part, we looked at the statements of who God is as part of that contract and who we are. And now we're dealing with kind of the stipulations, the do's and don'ts, what God expects from us in this renewed covenant. Now in Matthew chapter 5, we saw this renewal Jesus brings of internalization of the commandments. So things like, um, you've heard that it was said, do not murder. But I tell you, do not be angry. Where Jesus takes the commandments, the Mosaic commandments, and internalizes them. In chapter 6, we're now getting into more internalization of our behavior and our attitude. So, for example, in this section, we're going to look at giving. We're going to look at uh, fasting and prayer. Now, I want to focus today on prayer in Matthew 6, because we find the most famous prayer of all time here, the Lord's Prayer. And too often, I think we miss the intention here by just memorizing it and kind of having it as this prayer we're supposed to pray, or we break it down into bite-sized pieces in terms of an outline or a model prayer. Now, granted, it's important. Jesus teaches us how to pray. In fact, in verse 9, he says, pray then this way. So what does he mean when he says, pray this way, and then gives us the Lord's Prayer? We're going to talk about that today. Let me just start off by reading the Lord's Prayer as it stands in the Gospel of Matthew. So beginning in verse 9. Pray then this way, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we have forgiven, also forgiven our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. Now you'll notice right away that I stopped with rescue us from the evil one. A lot of times when we pray this prayer in church, we'll add, For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. But that was not part of the earliest version of this prayer. And in fact, most of them you'll see in the margins or in the notes of your Bible, it'll say that that was not in the earliest manuscripts. And what that simply means is that probably as these manuscripts were copied and handed on through time, that they added that. You know, for yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Because that's how they prayed it in church. But originally, it didn't have that in there. So that brings us to the first main point. You'll notice that there are seven petitions. When we remove that last section, there are seven petitions we have in the Lord's Prayer. And they are that God's name be holy, that his kingdom come, that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that we have our daily bread. We forgive others as we have been forgiven, to not be led into times of temptation or trial, to be delivered from the evil one. So, seven. And whenever we hear the number seven, we should um, pay attention. Again, it's the number of completeness, the number of wholeness, the number of days of creation. So, seven is this very important number that says there's more going on here than just a list or just a prayer. The second thing to note is that the Lord's Prayer is in plural. So, when it says... Um, forgive us, rescue us. It's all in plural. And so we want to see this prayer as a communal prayer, but not only a communal prayer. Um, later in this section, Jesus talks about praying by yourself and praying alone. What's interesting about praying in the plural is that we begin to take the community we're with with us. So when we pray for things, we've got to think of how our requests fit in with the larger community that we're part of. How does what I ask for fit in and against what others, in fact, need? So having a communal perspective is incredibly important. Now, as we look at the structure, you'll notice a couple other things. The first three petitions, mm -hmm. God's name be holy, that your will be done 
um, and your kingdom come, those three are all you. We're talking to God. God, we want your name to be holy. We want you to come. We want your kingdom to be here. The last three are all very personal. Forgive us, lead us, not deliver us from. So the top three, you and your, the bottom three is us. So we have a movement kind of from God to us initially. And the fourth one is really important. There's something going on in this give us this day our daily bread will come to in a minute. So we have this movement, if you will, from you to us. And a bigger movement as we break this down from heaven to earth. Let's take a look at what I'm talking about. Verse 9, pray then this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So we're looking at God as holy, as set apart, as above. That's what holy means. God is set apart. He's above. We think of holy as being above us. And we want God's name, his um, authority to be respected. We want it to be holy and set apart. Okay, then, your kingdom come. Now you see this kind of movement from heaven to earth, right? We want God's kingdom, his rule, his reign to be here where we are. In fact, one of the main themes of Matthew from beginning to end is... Emmanuel, God with us. He's called that in, Gen in Matthew 1. At the very end of in Matthew 28, he says, I'll be with you always. So this whole gospel is about God being Emmanuel, God being with us. In Matthew 10, 7, it says, As you go, proclaim the good news. What's that good news? The kingdom of heaven has come near. So we have a movement, right? From God being holy to God's kingdom being here. And then, more specifically, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Again, a very specific now movement from God's will, you know, his righteousness being done on earth as it's being done in heaven. So again, we have this, this movement. Okay, in fourth, we have this strange request. Give us this day our daily bread. Now, so far, everything's been spiritual, right? God's holiness, God's kingdom, God's will, all have been spiritual. Now we get to lunch. So why bring up this now? And in fact, the last three we'll get to in a second are also spiritual things. Forgiveness, temptations, and trials, and evil. All spiritual qualities. Why would this very practical lunch type thing be here in the middle? Well, let's go on and let's kind of finish up the last three and then come back to the fourth one. Okay, so in the uh, verse 12, forgive us our debts or our sins or our trespasses, however you said it in church, as we also have forgiven our debtors. You know, this is kind of parallel to the third petition of God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven. So in a way, it's saying, like, forgive us in heaven as we forgive those here on earth. This is, again, very close to us. We forgive others around us as God forgives us. So again, another connection between heaven and earth, kind of on the flip side. We forgive others here as God forgives us. Do not bring us into, the time of tr into a time of trial. Again, that occurs here. Right? We are tempted inside of ourselves. We um, are tested inside of ourselves. Jesus is tempted in the wilderness or tested. By the way, that word, um, the Greek word for tempting or testing, same word. Um, the biggest difference between tempting and testing is in the intention of those giving the test. Um, those who are testing you want to see you succeed. Those who are tempting you want to see you fail. Um, but kind of the root is we have to come through. We've got to be ready for the test, be ready for the temptation. And the final one, rescues from the evil one. We think of evil as even below us. Like if you've seen Lord of the Rings, um, the orcs are, come from under the earth. We think of Satan as under our feet, under the earth. So evil has this under, underneath type quality. And so this prayer goes from, literally from this, the highest heaven of God's holiness down to evil beneath our feet. So therefore, what is in the fourth one? Like, what is the connection then between um, these two worlds, if you will, between heaven and earth? Well, we have, give us this day our daily bread. Now, most likely your Bible has a note there that says, we don't know what daily means. We know that bread's there, but there's a Greek word, epiusion, that's used there. Epiusion, that um, is what's called a hapax legomena. It's used only one time. Well, really here and in Luke in the exact same context. So we don't know what it means. Um, some scholars suggest it means your bread in due time, your bread as necessary. Um, if you break the Greek word epiusion apart into its component pieces, uh, it can mean beyond substance. 
So not knowing what it means has kind of created some controversy here. So daily is kind of default, like basically take care of our physical needs is how you'll often see this interpreted. Um, but I think it's much bigger than that. What's going on? Well, let's take a look first at what we do know, and that is the word bread. Um, this is not lunch. This is not praying for the stuff we need. That's, that's not its point. Again, it's too important. Everything else is here is spiritual. This is a spiritual uh, category as well. Well, bread always means something bigger in Jesus' world. Um, in the temptation narrative a couple of chapters ago in chapter 4, Jesus is tempted with bread, and he says it's not about bread. It's about the words that come from the mouth of God. That's what's important. Um, later, we'll see the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. What we'll find here is that there's a symbolic reference. In each case, one time, there are 12 baskets left over. The other time, there are seven baskets left over for the Jews and for the Gentiles coming together. That this um, feast of Jesus is not about giving them bread and fish. It's rather about the kingdom of God being present and that this big banquet feast of God's kingdom is now with them. In Matthew 16, Jesus says, Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees to his disciples. And they're thinking, Oh no, we've got lunch, we've got bread. He's like, No, it's not about bread, it's about their teaching. In John, Jesus says, I am the bread of life himself. We're on the road to Emmaus, uh, they're walking along and they don't recognize Jesus after the resurrection. But he's there. And he's teaching them about how the Messiah must suffer and die. And they don't get it. Until he does what? He breaks bread. And then, of course, we have this act that we do every week, the breaking of the bread, communion, Lord's Prayer, the Eucharist, where we say, this is the body of Christ, given, broken for you and for me. So what's going on here is that this bread is truly beyond substance. And if you look at it as the Lord's Supper or as the connection to Jesus, it makes sense. Because how is God's will being done on earth as it is in heaven? How is his kingdom coming, his name being made holy? Through Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection. And how do we find forgiveness and give forgiveness? How do we overcome temptation through the Holy Spirit? How are we rescued from the evil one? By Jesus and his life, death, and resurrection. So what I think is going on here is that Jesus is the center of this prayer. That we want God's name to be holy. We want his kingdom to come. We want his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that is given through Jesus, our bread beyond substance, our the sacrifice for our sins and for our lives so that we can forgive others as God forgives us, that we can be rescued from the times of trial and from evil, that this prayer is really our story with God. That, and in fact, by the way, it works in the reverse direction. Think of it as the story of humanity. It begins with Adam and Eve in a garden. And evil shows up, Satan. And what does he do? He tempts them to do the one thing they're told not to do so that they need to forgive each other and to be forgiven by God. How is that done? How are we, who are the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve, how are we to be forgiven for our sins and the things we've done wrong? Well, through the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And after that, this new community of Christians cannot go and do God's will on earth as it's being done in heaven. We see what Jesus says in Matthew 10, that his kingdom has come and is with us. And that through us, God's name can be made holy by the Spirit living in us. And that by our following Jesus, God's name is being made holy through us. And then truly, we are then the light of the world and the salt of the earth, as we've been called to be. So this prayer is really, again, a story, not an outline, not a rote prayer to memorize and just repeat, but rather a story. And so maybe this week, as maybe a challenge to you, when you pray this prayer, just stop. And be say, like, hey, our Father in heaven, I want your name to be holy. And how can I do that today in my life? I want your kingdom to come. But may it come through me by how I act with those around me and how I treat other people. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Help me to be obedient to the things you called me to do and to be. And where I'm not, show me so I can do better. And thank you for Jesus who makes this possible. And we celebrate his life, his death, his resurrection. Thank you for him. Teach us to forgive others as we've been forgiven. If there's people in my life that I need to forgive, show those to me and, and help me to do that. And forgive me for the sins and the things that I'm doing wrong and to repent of them and to be more righteous. Save me from temptation trucks. I know they're going to come today. Trials and temptations are going to show up. I want your help that you can deliver me from those and keep me from evil. 
there's a lot going on in our world that is truly evil and rescue me from that. And so this prayer then is a story, our story with God. And I pray that this is something that can maybe help you today better connect with our life with God and the miracle and the gift that is Jesus who connects our two worlds. Thank you. We'll see you next time.